asking about uh, polyploidy. So I, I will just like start uh, one step back. I know that at this point you all will be bored by this small recap, but uh, that's a good thing. You need to be very familiar with the chemo spectra. Uh, so this chemo spectrum is, uh, we already know that, that the errors are usually on low frequency, that you usually we see the dipoid peak, we see some uh, duplications. We know that this is a diploid species for, from karyotype data, so it has a low heterozygosity. Everything is fine. Um, then it, it becomes more complicated when we have the heterozygous schemas, uh, but it's still quite like a readable kind of histogram. So it's it's kind of fine. Like it's it's nothing that would really confuse us on this one. Like we we but just by looking, we quite know which peak is which. Uh, so, so these are like the, 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 the main genomes. So the reason why I wanted to show you this is because I would like to really give the big shout out to Riker who made like all the combinatorics behind Genome Scope 2. And uh, it was a great pleasure to collaborate with Riker. So he, when we wrote his manuscript, he did the Genome Scope part and I did the smash plot part. And uh, it was published last year. So Riker's interest was to be able to uh, model also the polyploid genes and you already fit a few polyploid genes so you see that it is possible and just the, simply the idea is that you just see how many copies are there by looking at a number of peaks and in this kind of case it's clear and actually in my experience triploids are almost always clear because uh, the 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 first and the third peak i have this unique positions that are like one third of each other which is uh, uh, not shared by practically anything else possibly hexaploid but there are not that many of those. And uh, so if we have a, a chemistry structure like this, we are also not in doubt. And uh, this is actually a melody gene, a root node nematode. This is another root node nematode, but it's much less clear. So uh, the, what I was trying to get is with the triploid genome like this, it's, it again, does not leave us a much doubt of what ploid it is. But if we see a chemo structure like this, it's a lot more hard. Is it triploid? Is it a triploid? Is it pentaploid? What, what it actually is, we see this is probably a very heterozygous species. That's one thing we can tell for sure because the first peak seems to be very large and there is no indication whatsoever of anything uh, smaller than that. So I guess this is the case where we are quite sure about one and estimate, but not about the ploid. So we were, we were thinking, so it, 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 this is actually how it started, that we were thinking, is there more information that came as we could utilize to somehow guess uh, which is the heterozygous peak? So we had this idea that if we take a came spectra, a came as spectrum and cut it from left and right side. So because usually when we're trying to figure out which of these peaks have heterozygous came as, we don't really care about uh, peaks that are super repetitive. No, we care, and we really don't want to have any sequencing errors in there. We, so we would like to find a range, which are the two parameters of the model, L and U, that will cut out all the genomic KMS that are in relatively high complex regions of the gene. Now, within this bulk of real, like real genomic gamers, real because like we don't know they are real for sure, but like hopefully real genomic gamers, we're searching for gamers that are different by a single SNP. Well, I guess S and V. Like and we also pick only those gamers pairs that form a unique pair. So if you have a transposable element that has lots of uh, copies and there are like a few variants, it won't, it won't become a a unique pair because you would have more than one KMA that is exactly distant by one. So we're searching for KMA pairs that are really always different by one SNP and they form a unique pair. So uh, examples, uh, this two would form a unique pair because they are different by the last nucleotide. Uh, and we hope that uh, these uh, pairs will be representing mostly the alleles that of the same locus. So the heterozygous KMA. And I, I, I thought there was an example of which one I would discard, but okay, that doesn't matter. You, you can imagine, they must form a unique pair. So now that we sub-selected sub all the came pairs, we can do a two informative transformation. 
one is the sum of their coverages, which will tell us about how many genomic copies of these came a pair are in the genome. And the second transformation would be the coverage ratio or like my local coverage ratio where we do a coverage of the less covered one divided by coverage of both, which is sort of the proportion of the cameras of the less represented allele. And so what, what this these, uh, transformation would tell us? Well, if we have different genomic structures, so we have uh, a camer that is there twice in total, so supposedly on, on the two haplotypes and one end coverage is 100, then the sum would be half and the coverage ratio would be 0.5. Then it would, for triploid, it would be 0.33 and 300. And then now it's becoming interesting. When we have tetraploid loci, we can actually distinguish between AAAB types of loci and AABB loci, which will be have uh, the same coverage sum, but different coverage ratio. And etc. And th this is some, this is just a very pretty thing to do. So it sort of like spreads the, the 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 genomic structure. The only problem is that we selected the chemo pairs in a very non-random fashion. So it, this is sort of like giving you a relative genomic structure, not absolute. So this is how it can look. This is the 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 smudge plot. What how we call these plots? Where so on the x-axis we have the coverage ratio, and the y-axis we have the total coverage. So we have the the, the we see that a lot of AB types of loci. We see a lot of AAB types of loci, but most of all we see a lot of AAAB types of loci. So here is a small summary: what's the fraction of camers in each category? So that's why we guess that melanogen in the area, a root node nematode, is a tetraploid. So practically speaking, we are asking where are the camers that are pairing with each other? So, and this is what sort of tells us about the uh, diploidy. So those that are AABB are camers from this peak paired with themselves. The camers that are AB are camers from the first peak paired with themselves. Camers that are AAB are the, the first and second peak together, and AAAB is the first and the third peak. Which is sort of, it's it's still just a visualization, but it tells us something about how to interpret the chemistry spectrum, which is really sweet, and it did help us to make some uh, uh, interpretations. Um, I have just a very few, oh the questions, uh, and we're different. Okay, what are A and B? Oh, A and B are just placeholders for the two alleles. Yeah, thank you, Simon. <laughs> uh, Oh, thank you. That just three responses to one question. <laughs> um, okay, so an application example. Um, this root node nematode, melodogen fluoridensis, was always a mystery because it was uh, thought to be a meiotic uh, parthenogenetic species within a clade of mitotic ones. And it weirdly, all those species are polyploids, while melanogen fluoridensis, according to a cytology study in 2002, was diploid. So people were spending a loads of effort of figuring out whether the phylogeny is wrong, and they just could not figure it out. Like everything confirmed um, melanogen fluoridensis to be part of the group one uh, root node nematodes. Well, the problem is that it's not diploid. So this is the part that they didn't get right. It's a, somehow this old cytology study must either took a different specimen or the one that they had in the lab was not the same thing. Well, of, it's very likely that the what was done on cytology on and what they sequence, sequence genome of are just not the same thing. So what, uh, it's hard for me to tell which of them is melanogen fluoridensis because I'm not a naturalist in rudo nematodes. And uh, Dave Lund would swear to you that they were phenotypically exactly the same, they must be the same species, but perhaps different strains or something. But what I can tell for sure is that this species that they have sequenced and placed within melanogen is a triploid. So this is a smudge pot that is like very clearly showing that it's predominantly having the the, came, uh, the loci of AAB type. And we, we also kind of from the smudge pot and genome scope can tell like what different types of uh, polyploid we are seeing. So while these melanogen fluoridensis 
Yo, wait, one thing I forgot to say. This is the reason why they thought it's a diplot because when they assembled it, they see, have seen just the A and B haplotypes, but they really have not distinguished between the two A's. So because the two of the haplotypes of Melodigene floridensis are extremely similar. While in, in the, the sister species, Melodigene incognita, the, the, all three haplotypes have certain levels of divergence. And that's why you have much brighter A-B smudge. And also, if you look at the KMS spectra, you have a lot fewer, uh, like a lot lower the, the, the second and third peaks, which means that fewer KMS are shared by two or three haplotypes. They have like a lot more those that are unique. So that's just an, uh, one application. Uh, I wanted to point out also the, the, the drawbacks. If you have a genome like this that has practically no heterozygosity, by the way, this is also a drawback of genome scope. The fact that it's willing to fit here the peak that is clearly not there, it's obviously an inference problem. Uh, but this is like a completely homozygous genome. We know that for sure, because that's, uh, this uh, species is reproducing with a gamete uh, uh, duplication, like it's like and the duplicated material. So it's like deployed, but clonally deployed. And, uh, and when we do the smudge plot, it, it, it sort of generates us an impression of a diploid, but with a wrong one and a coverage. And the reason is because there are just zero heterozygous loci. There should be one smudge over here, but it's not there because there are non heterozygous loci. So all the labels get shifted by one. So the, the, if we would uh, get it right, so the, the, the true uh, one and coverage is not, it was not uh, 68x, but 34x, and the true labels would be this. So if there are there is no heterozygosity, smudge plot is looking at just the structure of the duplications. And uh, the, the last example is very tasty. And it is just to show you that they have this like uh, octoploid strawberry uh, cultivar. And when we run it through SmudgePod, we actually did manage to detect that it's octoploid, which we were extremely pleased about. So it's just like a uh, just kind of funny story. And that's kind of all from my side, I think. Yeah. Oh, huh. I wonder if you would like to hear about this too. <laughs> yeah, so the, the, this, all those genome profiling methods we're using are sort of based on some simplistic ideas about the genomes, but at the same time, they allow us to look at the raw data. So like, I hope that right now that you are able to both evaluate the drawbacks and the powers of KMAS. And uh, with the genome scope, uh, what I wanted to say that it's it's a uh, problematic is that when the heterozygosity gets saturated, if you have over uh, like twelve percent, uh, it, it just gets too much. Like it, basically, there are no homozygous KMS, and therefore it's just completely impossible to distinguish between heterozygosity there is twelve percent and heterozygosity there is twenty percent because the KMS picture just looks exactly the same. Uh, the coverage estimate must be right. The uniform distribution of heterozygous loci, loci and duplications across the genome is also a strong assumption of the mode. Um, and the benefits you already know about. And with the smudge pod, we can also have a similar uh, assumptions and strength. The, if the, the problem is that we need to see some heterozygosity to get a good idea. If the heterozygosity is dominated by paralogy or duplications, then we, we might get a wrong image. And we don't actually have it so optimized. So it's actually still computationally right, quite expensive to create a smudge plot. So I've seen that there was a, 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 a genome that has three gigs uh, size. So it is computable, but it's not optimized. So like we can give it a try if you want to uh, get the ploidy of the plant, but uh, it might be sneaky. Oh, what is paralogy? Uh, yeah, it, there was a typo. It, it, I meant to write paralogy. So I mean, I meant duplication, like uh, uh, copies of the same sequence within the same genome. Yeah, the strength of special plots is that like it's sort of very non parametrically just describing you what you have in your genome, which is nice. And that's it. <laughs>